All right, welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. Today is August the 13th, 2017, and we've got a couple of guests today, Niels Hobbs, and I'll get the other two on in a minute. Um, let's do short introductions and go from there. Um, why don't we start with Derek and work our way over? Hi, I'm Derek Hussey, publisher of Hippocampus Press. Kelly? I am Kelly Young. I am the uh, executive editor of Strange Eons Magazine. Matt? Hi, I'm Matt Carpenter. I occasionally edit books for Ulthar Press. Pete? I'm Pete Relic, but you don't have to. <laughs> Rick? I'm Rick Lay, a writer. Uh, I'm Mike Davis. We've got Niels Hobbs with us, one of our three guests today. Uh, actually, since I'm so used to only having one guest, I accidentally sent the the uh, show link to just one person, but I corrected that a minute ago, so our other two guests will pop in here in a second. But we're going to talk to Niels first because he has an appointment later. So, hey, Niels, how's it going? All right. How are you guys doing? Good. Right. Um, so let's talk about Necronomicon one week from now, less than yeah. one week. Actually, yeah, less than one week. Uh, I think I can start counting it in hours now, which is great because it also means I can start counting in hours the time when I can actually start sleeping to some <laughs> degree of restfulness once again. It, it'll take another month or so, really. But, uh, but yeah, so um, we are essentially three days away from the first waves of Necronomicon start crashing on Providence. Okay. Um, so Wednesday night we have a, a pre-party for some of the early arriving guests. I think we already have guests coming in um, this weekend. As a matter of fact, we've already had some attendees and guests come to the store here. Hey, what's the difference between that and the quote Necronomicon kickoff party? So there's a so the pre-party is technically really before the program. You know, the core programming actually starts, and then we have a, a big outdoor fest party that we're doing with one of our big sponsors, Narragansett Brewery, uh, and that's Thursday night, um, and that's kind of the real big sort of outdoor party with a bunch of bands, um, big Nazo intergalactic bands that has played before is going to be playing. Um, there'll be a big beer garden thanks to Narragansett. And uh, one of our other partners here, uh, um, New Harvest uh, Coffee and Spirits. So that'll be kind of the, the real big block party. And that's really effectively where everybody is basically already here. Um, the night before at Aurora, the pre-party is a little bit more of a casual affair. Uh, we have author readings. That's essentially almost an open mic. So any authors that are in town are welcome to step up and read either a classic passage or something of their own. Uh, and then we'll also have some movie screenings as well, uh, including we're, spe we're planning on doing a special screening of uh, Romero's Night of the Living Dead after his recent passing. Um, just kind of a fun thing to have on in the background while we all hang out. Okay. What's next after all that? So, uh, so I mean, Thursday is really the first kind of big day where a lot of things are happening. Um, I, I should say up front, we've got a ton of walking tours and bus tours. Those are kind of you know, some of the real big sort of external things that get people to really get out and about and explore uh, Lovecraft's Providence um, in a way that obviously you, you know, you don't have an opportunity to do otherwise. Um, and then we also have that night uh, our welcoming ceremonies at the First Baptist Church at five. Um, we have the art gallery, uh, sort of the opening, ceremony, the opening um, reception for our art exhibition, Ars and Economica, up at the RISD Woods Gary Gallery. And, and we also have some of our um, at the Dark Adventure Radio Theater and that kind of stuff are all starting at the same time. Um, so right off the bat, we pretty much jump everybody into the deep end. Um, and then, of course, that's just essentially the warm-up to give you a nice big hangover um, for the next day when the core programming starts um, at 9 a.m. with panels and things. Um, all right, so what's next? I mean, walk us through what you'd want to let everybody know about Necronomicon, I guess. Right. So, you know, I mean, so Necronomicon, this is now the third iteration that we've been in charge of, you know, sort of this, this crew of people that took it on several years ago, um, following in the wake of the really excellent ones that happened back in the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, and, it's, and it's really sort of at the core, it's, it's uh, a, a combination of things. It's very much a um, Lovecraft weird fiction 
convention and festival, um, but also one that draws on a lot of other elements of weird fiction that, you know, in one way or another can kind of be traced to Lovecraft or are um, new branches that have kind of developed on their own organically, um, which is a good weird reference, I guess. Uh, and, and so we're really proud of, you know, um, this sort of multifaceted approach of, of presenting Lovecraftian weird fiction, cosmic horror, um, sort of all the little um, various facets of that community, uh, and highlighting all the different ways in which it's expressed. So we have academic panels talking about different um, aspects of literature, um, life of Lovecraft, um, various authors that he collaborated with, and then also um, uh, you know, highlighting art and film that have been influenced by weird fiction and by Lovecraftian fiction. Um, so we have a huge film component. Uh, we have, you know, the Ars Necronomicon that's going on for two weeks starting, actually starting Wednesday, starting this Wednesday is the first day, going till the end of the month. Um, so there's so many different things that are going on um, to really kind of immerse people in um, sort of the weird world that, that has developed over the past 100, 100 plus years um, and, and with its center here in Providence. And so obviously at the same time, we're also really happy to promote Providence as well. And that's one of the reasons like Donovan Laux, for example, has developed these incredible walking tours and bus tours that kind of highlight all of the uh, weird side of Providence, especially Lovecraft-related sites, places he lived, places he wrote about, and that kind of stuff. Things that are very unique to uh, a pilgrimage to Necronomicon. Um, one thing I have to comment on for people who haven't been there before, this is not what you would call a linear experience. You aren't going to get to see everything. You are going to have to pick and choose. It's like there's no help for it. It's like you look at the program, concurrent with what you want to do are two other things that you want to do. And that's just it. So each year I've tried to do a different track to look at something. I think, well, I'll never ever get a chance to see that again. And some people like to go to all the panels. Okay, well, but some people say, I never get to the film festival. I'll go to all the films. And then others say, like, you know, if Kelly were here, he'd just want to go to McCormick and uh, stay at the bar. So I hope somebody walks in to hit my tab up. You know, it's like, it's just, there's going to be different things for everybody. I've already got some irresolvable conflicts. You know, it's just the way it goes. It's supposed to be like that. You're supposed to love it, but leave wanting more. I think if you stay long enough at the bar, somebody eventually pays your tab, right, Kelly? Oh shit! I wish. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kelly, that with that time we were in um, Portland, wasn't our bar tab like five six grand? It wasn't five or six grand. It was five or six hundred. That's an exaggeration, Pete. Oh, uh, you know, you can't help me out. <laughs> anyway, Niels, answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass on that one. Uh, please the all right, you know, there's so many, I'm, I'm scrolling through the extended programming page and the core programming page, and there's so much here that I hardly even know what to ask. Um, do you want to talk about highlights from maybe each part of the film festival? Like, I mean, of the, I'm sorry, yes. it's not a film festival. You know, you got the film festival is what I was going to say. Mm -hmm. You got the, the panels. Mm -hmm. You got the gaming. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you want to touch on some something from all of those. Right, right. So you got um, the tours too. I forgot that. There's a lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's the thing. I, you know, I think every time we try to list all the different major facets, we always forget two or three, and then we still have you know fingers, hands full of uh, fingers that are up. Um, the you know some of the highlights, like I think, are kind of easy if you think about in terms of some of our guests of honor. Uh, so Richard Stanley is one of our guests of honor this year, the filmmaker that made. Kind of one of my favorite classic cult classic sci-fi movies, Hardware. Um, he's coming to show a bunch of different um, special films of his, including um, Dust Devil, which I think is a really pretty Lovecraftian weird tale. Uh, and also highlighting um, some of the other aspects, like John Jude Palancar is our artist guest of honor this year, who's done some of the most incredible um, work related to weird fiction and Lovecraft, and has illustrated so many different book covers. Um, we just saw his art the other day, and there are these massive pieces. We have one whole room up at the Woods Gary Gallery at RISD dedicated just to his stuff, and just that room alone is so incredibly impressive. 
Um, and then, you know, honestly, beyond that, the it's, it's hard, to, you know, that's, of course, it's like picking your favorite child when you have a thousand dark young, essentially, <laughs> to pick one. Like, how do you choose? Um, yeah. One of the things that we're really proud of, the, the panels committee really tried to do their very best to balance some really external pressures in terms of having a lot of really good core programming focusing on sort of the classic question, classic themes, you know, various aspects of Lovecraft and his fiction. Um, the difficulty is we've done so much of that in the past um, for, the, for the previous one, it was the 125th anniversary of Lovecraft. And so there, something like 90%, something like 90% of the programming was dedicated to Lovecraft. And now with that behind us, we're um, in a better position to kind of really move on and still have, I think, something like 40 or 50% of our programming is directly Lovecraft related. Um, but we can really sort of expand and talk more about um, Ambrose Bierce, and, you know, have a panel on him and uh, more on Chambers and uh, the women that Lovecraft included in his circle. And then also start talking more about more contemporary. So probably one of the hot panels is going to be the one that we have on Tom Ligotti, which is certainly not the first time that there's been a Tom Ligotti panel. But for us, it's, it's really exciting to us to be able to develop that kind of stuff even more. Um, and again, all of it effectively traces still back to Lovecraft. We get a little bit of heat for some people thinking that maybe we're leaving Lovecraft behind. That's not at all the case. All of it still connects back to Lovecraft um, in one way. Well, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like reading Lovecraft. You can't just reread Lovecraft over and over and over. You want right. to read Lovecraftian tales. You know, right. you want to read cosmic horror, which is all a part of weird fiction. You know, you want to re read weird fiction stories. That's what it's all about. Right. Well, so conveniently, I'll just grab this, you know, sort of classic Del Rey here, which, by the way, has a really nice John Jude Palancar cover on it. Uh, yeah. And, you know, this starts out with Lovecraft. And then from there, you get sent on to read some Clark Ashton Smith. Um, there's some Fritz Leiber, uh, Brian Lumley, Ramsey Campbell. And this is really kind of what we want the convention to be about. I mean, it always will have that core foundation in Lovecraft. But I think we think that there's a much better... Um, tribute paid to Lovecraft when you can then trace it to all these other things that have come from, in one way, maybe not necessarily directly, you know, but have come out of weird fiction that Lovecraft bore. Um, so that's really, I mean, honestly, for me, that's kind of the thing that I'm most proud of for the whole thing. and I want people to kind of take away from, from the okay. experience. Uh, anything more on the panels or do you want to talk about the film festival? Uh, let's hang on. Derek has a question. Why don't you go ahead, Derek? Oh, thanks, Mike. Uh, I just wanted to ask, in addition to the panels, it seems like you have the symposium going on, which is totally dedicated to Lovecraft. Could you talk a little bit about that? Right. So, uh, th you know, again, because I, I come from a science background, my experience with establishing conventions and conferences has always very much been from a science background. I've, I've been involved in organizing a number of other convention conferences that are science conferences. And so my dream from the start of this, and we've been doing it since 2013, is to have you know, what we now call the Armitage Symposium, where it is academics and scholars of various levels of, of experience um, and pedigree coming and presenting their own novel research, their own essentially cutting edge, you know, partially vetted, but still raw research that they've done into various aspects of Lovecraftian and weird fiction. It's generally not completely strictly Lovecraft related stuff, but, but that very often is sort of the focus of much of this work. And I personally feel like that is exciting because it is going to be the next wave. Some of those names are going to be the next generation of Lovecraft scholars. Um, so for me, that's something I'm really kind of most proud of coming out of overall Necronomicon. You know, I have a, before we, I had a question about the film part, festival part of it, but before we get to that, you know, I have a real basic question about you and Lovecraft and this convention because it, just looking at this, being a guest there, you know, two times now, I think this is my third time, this is a hell of a lot of work on your part and the part of the people who are helping you. Uh, number one, we really appreciate it because this is a great convention. Uh, we, I, I really enjoy it. Number two, what made you decide personally to want to do this every two years? He's, uh, you're you're, you're rethinking it now, aren't you? I, I, uh, <laughs> I don't you know, remember. That, that becomes a question that becomes more and more difficult sometimes to answer. But 
Um, I mean, again, there, there's sort of two, I'll try to give two quick answers, I'm, and I'm terrible at two quick answers. Uh, but, uh, you know, for me, Lovecraft is very influential in my life. It's a, he's a large reason why I live here in Providence. He's, he's a substantial, huge reason why I have a PhD in marine biology um, and work with creatures that are effectively of the ilk that he would uh, describe in purple prose. Um, and so I feel like I owe a lot to Lovecraft for kind of bringing me to the place where I am in the world. Um, and likewise, at the same time, and, th and that's sort of the general feeling for most of the convention organizers as well. Um, but also, uh, equally, uh, we also really love the city. We love the same city that, prob that, that Lovecraft loved. And so we love doing something that is really amazing and unique and special and brings people from around the world. Last time it was something like 18 countries, five continents came to Nectar Mama 2015. Um, and that's, that's something that really makes us incredibly proud. And it makes it uh, easier um, to put up with some of the, the difficulties that we go through. Well, it is really appreciated. I can't imagine not having a Necronomicon to go to every two years. So thanks for doing all that you do. Uh, okay, so talk about the films a little bit. Um, so one of the things I'll say up front real quick is, um, you know, we also try to have programming that's accessible to the general public. So you don't have to just buy a pass to go to the entire thing. You don't have to buy an $80 or even a $30 day pass. Um, the films are all essentially external programming um, where you can just buy a $5 day pass and just go to a day's worth of some of the best weird films. So the film committee headed by Phil Gillette, who you've had on the show before. Yeah, yeah, wrote, great. Wrote, great. He wrote, I think, one of the very best Lovecraftian sci-fi films ever, Europa Report, um, right. who is now finishing um, a Laird Barron adaptation, um, which is supposed to be amazing from what I've heard. Um, him and that committee put together such a great, unique, it's, it's definitely built around the guest of honor, Richard Stanley. There's a few of his pieces. But then we're really digging up some amazing old gems, um, like Mal Pertwee's, the, the retelling of the Jean Ray uh, story from the 70s starring Marlon Brando, and it's just an amazing, weird, weird piece of 70s cinema. Um, and then some other great things like Penda's Fen, which is really sort of this amazing cult, uh, cult in all ways um, film from, from England, and uh, a few others that are just incredible. And then in addition to that, we have some great shorts. We have three different shorts collections that we've put together, that our own film committee has put together, and then our friends at the H.P. Lovecraft uh, Film Festival have also put together a great collection of sort of their greatest hits over the past years. So Brian and Gwen are bringing that uh, to screen those a few times as well. So it's a really amazing collection of films. So literally, you could just come and do those and have your fill um, and ignore the four tracks of panels and author readings and you know, two or three tracks of um, theatrical productions like a Dark Adventure Radio Theater and the walking tours and the gaming and the art exhibition and all that stuff. You could ignore that and just have a great time at a film festival if you wanted to. Yeah. yeah. I know a lot um, of people are uh, excited about Phil's uh, Laird Barron adaptation. Is he going to be showing anything from that there? So uh, I, I, I shouldn't say, I think, um, but... <laughs> It's okay, currently, nobody's watching, don't worry about it. Currently the plan is that, uh, that it, it hasn't gotten permission to be screened, sadly. Like, the okay. producers want to kind of hold off a little bit longer before they do the first screening. But well, that's too bad, but it's understandable. Yeah, yeah. Anyone else have a question for Niels? I, Niels has got to go in a little bit. He's got an appointment, so I don't want to keep I've got going. To, I've actually got to run off to a volunteer meeting. I've got to, we've got to go wrangle some minions, so I need to... Go talk to them all. Need to get out of I, here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll let you go oh, then. Pete, did you have a question? Nope. Go. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you all very go, much. Go. It was great. Thanks, Neil. We'll see you this coming week. We'll oh, see you in a yeah, few days. Hopefully, I'll see all of you uh, in a few days. All right. Take care. See you, Nils. See you, Nils. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, and that's why we have three guests today because our, all of our guests are on for a brief time. So uh, we'll, see, we'll see Niels in a few days. Our next guest is Kenneth Height. Hey, Ken. You can hit your unmute button there. Right. There you go. Hey, Mike, How you doing? Thanks for uh, letting me uh, weasel my way in. <laughs> it's no problem at all. Glad you're here. Yeah, no, happy to be here. So talk about your first book and then talk about the, the current Kickstarter. 
Okay. The first book is Tour to Lovecraft the Tales, which I providentially have a copy of right here. So there we go. See? Yeah. Lovely cover by Hal Mangold, the publisher and graphic uh, designer of it. And you um, that, that currently out of print? That is out of physical print. You can still buy it on Kindle. But yeah, I have it on Kindle. Yeah. We're we're uh, we're leading up to exciting news about that. But this is uh, where I look at all of the sort of Lovecraft solo stories and through the gates of the Silver Key because and respond to each of them. It began as a series of blog entries, so it's sort of unformed dough. But I guess that's good because you're looking for first responses and something to let people who are new to Lovecraft maybe come onto it. So it talks about what the critical response has been to a story or some element of the story that you can see prefigured in other stories. Uh, my response to it, occasionally I sort of just go nuts and make something up because why not? Uh, or when the story um, uh, really sort of triggers something. Like, for example, uh, while I was writing the piece on Haunter of the Dark, it suddenly occurred to me, this is like a reverse grail myth. I don't think anyone has ever said that. I'm going to say it, and I just did. It's not, um, right. uh, it's not really any of it uh, consistent, but it's always a response. And what it is overall is a look at what have people said about Lovecraft? What do I say about Lovecraft? And inviting people into sort of the Lovecraftian uh, criticism, Lovecraftian commentary game, uh, because that's what we're about, right? Is everyone responding to Lovecraft? And I, uh, you know, the the goal is to make sure that. Uh, people can come to Lovecraft. There's, you know, in the introduction, there's that the answer to the question, which Lovecraft should I read? I give them that answer right up top so that they don't, you know, fiddle around and waste their time with uh, Herbert West Reanimator or something and uh, can, can <laughs> hey, jump right into the good stuff. Hey! <laughs> Ouch. They should not read Herbert West first. Come no, on. Herbert West is a, um, uh, it's when you're uh, drinking um, uh, vodka out of the ashtray at the bar. That's sort of the last. You know, you, you can't. You don't want to go home yet, but you know Ouch. you're in bad straits. Yeah, Pete, this all makes sense to me now. Thanks, Kenneth. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm 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 a I'm a gifted uh, imagist, I guess. <laughs> all right, so it, I mean, I'm not to say that people can't do great things with Reanimator, and obviously, it's still maybe the best Lovecraft film is Reanimator because it was done by such a great creative team. So, you know. The, the quality of the foundation doesn't say anything about the prettiness of the building on it. All right, so talk about the Kickstarter then. Okay, the Kickstarter is for Tour to Lovecraft The Destinations, which is the second volume in the series. And rather than look at it story by story, it looks at it setting by setting. Lovecraft, like I need to tell anyone on this panel, is hugely interested in setting. It's probably the second most important quality of any of his stories in some cases it's the only important quality of some of the stories and you look at that setting and the way that it takes part in the story and also i look at the settings longitudinally because the new york of he and the new york of cool air are different new yorks which is a different new york from horror at red hook and those are all different new york cities so he deploys new york city differently story by story by story but they're all part of the same symbolic new york that is part of his personal, uh, not maybe mythology, but his, his palette of imagery and his palette of symbolic concepts. So by looking at New York and Antarctica and Britain and uh, the woods and hyperspace as settings that cross over a lot of Lovecraft stories, you can maybe get kind of a parallax view of the sort of the Ur Lovecraftian concept or how Lovecraft's notion of them may have changed over time. Um, and then you can also do that, of course, with the Arkham's and Innsmouth's and Dunwich's, which he also deploys multiple times in multiple stories, but although Dunwich less so, but um, uh, each of them, uh, every time you mention Arkham, it doesn't mean the same thing in each story. So it's an examination of the settings longitudinally and symbolically, I guess. So as signs and as places. Uh, Can I ask him? Um, how I knew you were going to have questions, Matt. <laughs> I, well, I thought I really enjoyed the first book. It, it, was, it was very entertaining. Like you say, it was like being in a bar with a friend who knows a lot about Lovecraft and you're just chatting. I was just wondering, is this something that, um, how did you come up with this idea or is it also a bunch of blog entries you're consolidating or what's the difference here? Uh, the, the, the way that I came up with this idea is that Stephen Siegel, who used to be the nonfiction editor of Weird Tales, read that blog and said, if you ever come up with a column idea, 
I would love to run it in Weird Tales. And so we talked a little bit about it and came up with the idea of doing uh, settings. And so the first, I think, 14 of them have already appeared in Weird Tales under the column title Lost in Lovecraft, which you may have read when you were reading Weird Tales back in the day. Um, we decided to go not for the air supply uh, audience this time. We decided to go for the tour audience, which is why it's not Lost in Lovecraft uh, the complete Lost in Lovecraft or whatever. It's Tour to Lovecraft, The Destinations. And then as part of the Kickstarter, to answer uh, your question earlier, we are reprinting Tour to Lovecraft, The Tales, and expanding it based on stretch goals that people have already uh, funded. So we're adding, for example, a bunch of the revision and collaboration stories, uh, the ones, especially the ones that are really good, like The Mound, uh, Out of the Eons, Curse of Yig. And then you know, some of the ones that are maybe not so good, but are super interesting to talk about, like The Last Test, and some of the ones that are just, you know, that I just like, like um, uh, Horror at Martin's Beach, because, you know, I, I'm just a big old romantic who likes sea serpents, so I put it in my book. Now, you can get to this, I just tried this, just Google Tour to Lovecraft, The Destinations uh, Kickstarter, and you, it's the first result, of course. And, and as I, I say to, these words, there's 15 days to go. I, I also put it. the uh, link on the web page. Okay, thank you, Matt. Um, Ken, do you want to talk a little bit about the different awards here on the Kickstarter? Um, sure. Uh, let's maybe, see. You don't know all of them, but maybe just touch on a few of them. I mean, the basically the book, you can get it in four different fashions. You can get it in the good old digital fashion, which is just uh, Kindle or EPUB or PDF, depending on your favorite reader. And then you can go up to the tourist edition, which is the standard hardcover. It's um, uh, cloth bound, sewn binding. It's a nice hardcover. Uh, then there's the next one, which has got the leatherette cover, which is even nicer. And then the super nice one is gonna be handmade by um, uh, Sarah Hindmarch, a bookbinder of my acquaintance in Chicago. And it will be hand bound in leather and there's only a limited number of those because Sarah's only got so much time and uh, only has so much time for my nonsense, certainly. And so the, uh, and that's the sort of crazy expensive super bananas issue edition if you want right. that. But you can get it, you know, like I say, any price point, you can find a lovely version of my uh, goings on about Lovecraft in that price point. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Well, it's it's uh, already been funded, so you're guaranteed yeah. to get the book. Yep, guaranteed to get it. Yeah, yeah. I sure hope you make your goal, Ken. Your five thousand goal, five thousand dollar goal, and you're up to twenty five thousand three hundred. So, well, that's that's the we cross fingers. <laughs> um, and then we have the st the stretch goals, um, as you noted earlier, that are just adding more destinations, um, adding more uh, coverage to the original tales book. So, for example, the next stretch goal that we're waiting to unlock is I talk about fungi from Yuggoth and um, uh, another essay will maybe cover the rest of Lovecraft's poetry, which is, you know, <laughs> more more of a um, uh, here be dragons than an actual uh, poetical response, but at least giving people a sort of a, a map to how to approach it if they decide they want to go into Lovecraft's poetry for some reason. And then in um, uh, the... Uh, the next stretch goal we open up, we do, I'll do an essay on the Arctic, which is the other half of Lovecraft's polar obsession and uh, one on Miskatonic University and say, what's that about? What is its role in the story? So that's basically as the, as we get more backers, as we get uh, more funding, we add more essays and we add more cool stuff to the books. Okay. Any other questions guys for Ken? So I have a, a self-serving question. Sure. <laughs> Ken. What's up, Pete? So, what are you talking about at Ringling? At Ringling, um, I'm I'm going down to Ringling College in Sarasota, uh, Florida, because uh, I probably our mutual someone here's mutual friend and mine, Rick Dakin, uh, teaches there, and he got me uh, wangled me an invite, and I'll be talking about game design down there. Nice. And how to how to make uh, role playing games, and ideally how to make uh, worlds and settings for role playing games, so that you can port that knowledge into uh, you know computer games or any other kind of uh, IP development, if that's what your little uh, undergraduate dreams carry you to. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, my son just signed up for what they're calling uh, Emerging Media Studies. Cool. So, yes. There you go. 
Well, uh, I am. I, I think my media emerged 40 years ago, but like, real, yeah, it's taking a while to sort of seep into global consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. What's the date on that? Do you know? Uh, September 19th is when I do my talk. So, okay. Um, uh, tell them not to cut class that day, no matter how nice it is outside. <laughs> <laughs> it's always nice in Florida. Yeah. Matt, got a question? Oh, yeah, actually, this is sort of like, unfortunately for you, it's a ritual we put all our guests through. You ask them to tell us about the books behind them and what's on the shelves. Not that it looks like you're in a storage closet or anything, but I was just wondering, is this your office? What is? Yeah, it? this is my office. This is where I write. Yeah, that, uh, that's a background there. Yeah, the books immediately behind me, like at the very far back, that's uh, games, uh, role-playing games. Uh, this is mostly old Fortean times uh, by now uh, with some reference material down there. This is stuff I'm using immediately in the present. So some of it is, you know, like annotated Frankenstein by our buddy Les Klinger. Um, that's for a Frankenstein LARP that I'm doing with uh, Emily Kerboss. Uh, a history of Memphis, Tennessee, because I'm doing a Memphis source book for Day After Ragnarok sometime uh, much later. And uh, we could do this all day, but um, Weapons of the Gods, which is a terrific game by... Uh, Jenna Moran that I will be using some of as I redesign Vampire the Masquerade. I'm the lead developer for Mas for Vampire now, and so we are going to adapt the brilliant uh, setting uh, stuff from that as a way to let people get into the world of darkness without having to read uh, 30 years worth of source books. And of course, good old Dan Harms' Cthulhu Mythos Encyclopedia. No office should be without it. So, uh, are you going to be in Providence? Will we get to see you in Providence? I will not, because it is the oh. same weekend as Gen Con, and no one is more heartbroken than me, except possibly my publisher, Hal, um, uh, who really, really loved Necronomicon last time we went, uh, two, uh, two years ago. But it's the same weekend as Gen Con, and I cannot not be at Gen Con. It's, you know, it's, it, it, it's the thing that you have to do if you're in game design. So well, that's you my thing. Will you be at the HP Lovecraft Film Festival in yes, October? I, uh, they have. Uh, uh, we are now talking about you know whether which panels I'll be on or whatever else, but I'm definitely going to be out in Portland in October, and hopefully I'll see everybody there. Yeah, that, great. I'll see you there. And Kelly's allowed. That's the convention Kelly's allowed to go to. So we'll see. Sure, they haven't. They haven't figured it out yet. Is anybody boycotting Gen Con? Um, <laughs> you know, th there may be. Frankly, we would kill for a boycott now. The there's like seventy thousand people going to come. Indianapolis is going to be innavigable. We, we really should have thought ahead and had someone boycott. I think that would Kenneth, really, I have two know, questions. Cleared out the aisles a little bit. Or, or not two questions. One is an observation. You're too clever by half. I didn't even get the air supply lost in Lovecraft reference until you pointed it out, which is... <laughs> well, that was Stephen's joke, not mine. So... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, secondly, did I miss it? You said that you had some exciting news about maybe Tour de Lovecraft coming back into, or not coming back into print. When Matt asked about it being out of print, you had some exciting news. Yeah, the exciting news is we're bringing it back into print as a result of the Kickstarter. So Never, never listens. I'm so sorry, Ken. Yeah, so That's... when we go, oh, I'm happy to replug the Kickstarter. I, I thought Kelly was just helping me out here, doing me a solid. You're, you're embarrassing. Well, I'm actually, you're, I'm you're actually... I'm actually a backer of the second one, so I'm yeah, I'm very interested so in all so this. So you'll get your print copy, and then obviously we're not going to print to order. Uh, so uh, we've got a, a distribution partner that will hopefully do a, a good job of getting them into not just gaming retail stores, but regular old bookstores like normal people go to. Fantastic. And yeah. if you are a regular old bookstore, we have a retailer uh, level on the Kickstarter, so you can come and back and get your pre-order in. And we won't even charge you early. Yeah, Derek. Yeah, I, uh, you mentioned that you have a LARP coming out based on Frankenstein. Is that going to be out for the bicentennial next year? That's the goal. Um, uh, Emily has done her half. It's it's me that is the slow coach right now. Um, but uh, yeah, we're going to have it out uh, by the bicentennial next year. Man, I love your office. That's that's the dream, just to be surrounded by books like that on all you know, on all three sides. You yes, know? It, the, uh, three and a half sides. It's, it's uh, <laughs> non-Euclidean because I've got a bookshelf in the middle of the office right there, and then there are more bookshelves over there that you can't even see. That's a Bradbury office if I've ever seen one. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Do we call Bradbury. that a fire trap, actually? that That's very dangerous right there. <laughs> 
Uh, do we have any more questions for Ken? No? Well, the Kickstarter, as I say, has 15 days to go. Um, just Google Tour to Lovecraft, the destinations, Kickstarter, and you'll come come right to it. And, um, yeah, I really enjoyed your first book, Ken. I've got it on Kindle. Uh, well, a quick question before you go. Uh, oh, sure. You said you're going to reprint Tour to, Tour to Lovecraft, the first one. Mm -hmm. um, would you advise anybody who's like not to rush out and buy the Kindle version right now because you, you've got some revisions in this print coming yeah, out, we'll, right? We'll be doing some revisions. I mean, obviously, just there's been another decade's worth of Lovecraft criticism to take on board. Yeah. Um, uh, there's one or two minor factual errors that probably need to be fixed. And then, as I say, the stretch goals, we're going to be adding a bunch more essays. So if you just can't live without it, you know, go ahead and Kindle it. But uh, in the future, there will be a better one available. So okay. uh, depending on how long you can hold out. Okay. Until If you can hold out until next October, I urge you to do it. But on the other hand, giving in to your febrile uh, dreams and desires is the Lovecraftian thing to do. So. All right. Well, Ken, thanks for being on the show. It's great to talk with you. No, it's always great to talk to you, Mike. And I'm uh, sorry that I'm going to miss Necronomicon. I really wanted to go, but oh, uh, Gen Con, man, same weekend. Well, we'll see you in October at the HP Lovecraft Film Festival. Absolutely. Uh, so. See everybody then. All right. Thanks, man. Bye. Have Bye. a good night. See you Bye. again. Bye. All right. He's always, he's always such an interesting guest. Um, Unlike our other guests. Um, yeah, unlike Niels that was just here. <laughs> no, Niels is always very interesting as well. And our next guest is pretty interesting, too. Hey, Glenn, how's it going? I'm like, I know that. Good. So talk to us about, well, let me read this. This is, I wanted you to, to briefly ask you about this game, because it looks so interesting to me. It's called Triptych. Am I saying that right? Uh, Triptych, yeah, like off the, uh, the three panel artwork. Uh, that people use. I'm not okay. Sure. But pretty much triptych, yeah. Uh, triptych is a Lovecraftian walking simulator written with a lore of Gnosticism, occultism, and cosmic horror. Legend has it that an ancient civilization once summoned an elder god down from the heavens and paid the ultimate price. They now live on as a necromantic cult that the Calm brothers accidentally discover in their lifetime. A somber, a somber narrative of deceit, familial betrayal, and impending doom weaves itself both through both characters' perspectives in a two-hour journey through madness. So, um, but this is not a game that you can go out and buy, right? It's a mod. Correct, yeah. Um, it's, it's a modification based off of the Crisis 1 engine, which was released in 2007. So basically, if anybody owns Crisis, whether on Origin or Steam or a disc copy, as so long as I have it fully patched up, we should be able to add my game on top and be able to play it for free. So you're, rather than something your like microphone's that, really um, crinkly. Is this any better? Uh, maybe so. Hope so. Hopefully a little better. Um, um, so, yeah, talk a little bit about the game. Yeah, so basically, um, rather than being able to go on Steam and buy it or Origin or something, um, it's based off the Crisis 1 game, which was released in 2007. So if you own that, you should be able to play my project for free. You just put it on top of it. But um, the description that you read, Mike, is basically a, uh, a synopsis for the story. So in olden times, the ancient civilization that once spanned half the globe pulled down a god from the heavens, basically using dark magic. What they thought would be, would be a benevolent god who end up being the Gnostic version of God, basically the demiurge, so somebody who is corrupt, evil, and wanted to kind of push his agenda on our realm of reality, so to speak. So once they realized that they pulled a, a malevolent force down, he enslaved the civilization and brought them to their knees. Um, and then this translates into modern times using um, Gnostic themes, basically. He's, um, he's put down by the civilization subdued, and then obviously using a necromantic cult, the survivors of this old civilization, he uses them to try to find his body, try to return to our realm and enact his malevolence again. So that is, in, uh, in a nutshell, a good description of the uh, So story. buy the Crisis game and then get the mod, right? Yeah, basically. If you own Crisis, you can play the mod for free. You don't have to pay uh, my okay. studio any money to upfront to pay, purchase or play it. 
I will put a link to Triptych on the summary, uh, podcast summary. Okay. And um, that way people can get to it. And awesome. for those Thank who you. have a crisis, yeah, that they can get the game. Uh, yeah, sorry absolutely. I have to kick you off a little early. We're having trouble understanding you. I'm sorry about that, man. Um, that, that's all right. I don't know what the difference between this and the video test was, but sometimes it happens. Google Hangouts is very moody. Yeah, absolutely. Do you want me to try to reconnect, or do you think it's just a, a permanent issue? Yeah, it's probably a permanent thing. So. All right, man. I'm sorry about that, but thanks for the, uh, thanks for the opportunity to go on the show, man. No problem at all. Thanks for being here. No problem, Mike. Have a good one. Yeah, that was kind of... Yeah, difficult to understand. Yeah. That's understand. really too bad. I linked the uh, Facebook page for the game to the uh, web, uh, the easing page. Okay, good. Um, it really looks fascinating. Yeah, it does. I really wanted to ask him more about it, but I guess you can just play the game too. It, it, that's why I wanted him on here. It's a fascinating, it looks very fascinating. Um, Matt, talk about your prize because we forgot to do that at the beginning. We're going to okay. redo um, the prize from last week because I forgot to give out the... This is a wonderful book. Dear Sweet Filthy World, put out by Subterranean. It is a numbered edition signed by the author. This is number 379. Uh, it is a Caitlin Kiernan story collection. So really, it would be a nice addition to anybody's book library. Okay. Um, Kelly. You saw Mr. Mercedes? I did. I liked it a lot. Yeah. Talk about it a little bit. Uh, it's, uh, it's on a channel called Audience, and it is a series adaptation of the Stephen King book, Mr. Mercedes. So if you haven't read it and you're looking for Supernatural Stephen King, you're not going to find it here. This is almost a police procedural book. It feels very much like a, like a Lee Weeks or a... Or a David Wambaugh or, or, you know, something like that, but it's done in King's writing style. And as you know, you and I both agree that nobody handles characters better than King. And uh, for my money, these books with the, the main character, Bill Hodges, and I believe there are three of them now, um, they end strongly, which is something King hasn't been doing lately with his novels. These ones end very satisfyingly. And this, series. I'm not sure if any of you guys get the audience channel. It's a bizarre, weird channel that is probably not available on everybody's cable provider. But uh, the lead... I'm, I'm assuming it would be available on Amazon, although I haven't looked yet. You know, Amazon yeah, and very, some video. It very well may be. Uh, the lead actor is Brendan Gleeson, and um, He's fantastic, and you could tell just from this first episode that they are willing to put the work in for character development, and uh, I'm really, really looking forward to this. I'm very excited with what I saw for the first episode. Yeah, I haven't read that book yet. It just didn't look like my, I guess because it doesn't look like the standard Stephen King. It is definitely book. not. It is not horror at all. I mean, there are some horrific parts to it but it is not a supernatural horror film it is a it is a retired police officer trying to capture the uh the killer from the the one case he couldn't solve while he was uh in as a police officer well uh, uh, I, I like stories like that what was that matt what network is it on it's called audience yeah i'm just gonna have to hope that I watch a lot of TV shows. Um, no, I don't watch a lot of TV shows. The few TV shows that I do watch I that aren't available on Netflix and, and places like that, I pick up on Amazon Instant Video, so maybe it'll be there. So, I hope so. It's, it's certainly better. I mean, if you've been struggling through The Mist, Matt, or uh, any other number of, of Stephen King shows, this one feels the most like whoever decided to make this actually enjoy the book and, and wants to put it out in a visual medium. It's no struggle to let the missed episodes accumulate unwatched in my queue. <laughs> <laughs> what were you going to say, Pete? 
So do you guys remember when we first got the whole idea of, of, of internet service and movie channels that were going to mine the history of, of everything that's been made to date and make it available? And we'd be able to watch anything on just one channel. It'd be like having a library card to, to, to movies. And now we're literally talking about having five, six, seven different pay-per-view services that will never, they're never going to let them cross over. What are you, what are you talking about? Cause I, I don't have TV at all. I just watch everything on Amazon or Netflix. Well, right. You have to have two, but there's more than two. There's Amazon and Netflix. Now Disney oh. has their own channel. You know, there's what Hulu and, and just, I don't even know what, I don't even know where to start anymore. Tell us all about it, Grandpa Rollick. Yeah, it's just... You know, it's the way of the world now. Get off my digital lawn. <laughs> if you're going to want to follow the Marvel Cinematic Universe, you're going to end up with so many channels, it's not going to be funny. Yeah. Yes. Who will? Coke and Dagger is going to be on something else. I don't have enough money or time. Look, I think there's essentially three that you got to have. Uh, okay. Netflix, yeah, Hulu, and yeah. Amazon. Okay, a lot of TV shows will show up the next day on Hulu, you know. But for yeah. those who don't, you can buy them on Amazon. I mean, everything's on Amazon, even the stuff that you can get for free on Hulu and Netflix. That's the so, holy trinity right now. But um, yeah. you see that CBS is going to a paid app. And if you want to watch the new Star Trek series, the only way you can watch it is on the paid app. It's not I, on their CBS I, channel. I think well, it's going to be on Netflix, too. Well, that's a bunch of bullshit if oh, that's the only one way to watch it. See, I, I, what I do is I'm on DirecTV, and um, for the uh, show that uh, we just talked about, Mr. Mercedes, is available to me, but then I have to buy the whole – I have to buy so many uh, additional channels – but my cable bill each month mm -hmm. is too high. Yeah. I, I checked Amazon. They don't have Mr. Mercedes in Amazon video. Oh, that's disappointing. Not yet. They may be waiting. You know, maybe it will become when the series ends. Or versus. Well, it's discouraging because usually um, with Amazon, the it's available the very next day, each episode. Yeah. All I'm so, saying is that I was promised flying cars, jet packs, you know, ATMs that were free, and, you know, a massive video library that I could pay one fee for. Yeah, you, you're, you're bitter, and we, we understand that. It is the distant future, the year 2000. I'm 50 years old now, and I'm going to complain. <laughs> That's right. Uh, let's wish... Pete, a happy birthday. He just had a birthday a couple days ago, and he turned the big 5-0. Happy Friday, birthday, Pete. yeah. Oh, my God. I'm so hungover, which might explain why I'm cranky. You're still hungover? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they brought over jello shots that were like, you know the, 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 the fake plastic cocktail cups that you get? They yeah. make jello shots in those. And I hadn't realized that they had used actually twice the amount of vodka than they, that they were supposed to. So after having three extra large oil shots, it was like having six. And you know, I feel like you're complaining somehow. Ah, uh, you know, I'll be okay. Making me remember Pete all the amusement parks that had futuristic rides like. Uh, you're too young to remember the World's Fair of 1964. Well, yes, yes, I am. Too, too bad that Joe can't be with us. You see, we, we could be nostalgic about it, but I remember reading General Electric and uh, General Motors had these great rides about the future. And I think there's one in the Epcot Center, probably still there. And none of these futures have come. As far as what, what it would look like. Actually, I believe in the early 70s, I was promised thermonuclear war. Yeah. And 
We're working on it. We're working. Yeah, we're getting there. Um, speak. We sh speaking of Joe. We should talk about Joe and tell the audience that he's doing a little better. Uh, I think he's still in the hospital, as I say these words, but um, he's recovering. So that's good. Fantastic news. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Matt, did you want to talk more? Uh, Niels could not stay very long um, because he had that appointment. Did you? I know that you wanted to talk more about Necronomicon. A little and what bit. What you're looking forward it, to? It, it gets into you just can't go to everything. It's like this is okay. This is my my beef. All right. Mm -hmm. They have done a good job of blocking out an hour or so for lunch each day. But right after the last program finishes, somewhere around 5.45, the next program starts about 6 p.m., and that's when they have some of the um, extended programming, performances, uh, live stuff. And so, like, and then there's something to go till till 10 o'clock each night or more. So you've got to make a choice. Are you going to go with your friends who you never see, go have a nice dinner for a couple hours, and miss two or three things going on at the same time, which is probably what's going to happen. I'm going to want to hang out with my friends. You know, it, it, the um, opening ceremony is at the First Baptist Church. It has been well worth going to every time I've gone. Uh, they always have some great organ music. They usually have a speaker, controversial or not, uh, expected or not. But then at 6 o'clock, okay, you think you're with all your friends at the First Baptist Church. Watching people go up in flames. What? You're, you're going to go stroll down to a restaurant, have dinner for an hour or two or so, and then maybe you'll go off and do some of the extended programming. Well, right starting at 6 p.m., there's something to do. And so what I've pretty much decided is I, I, I made a list of all the things I was really interested in doing, and I looked at it the other day and I realized I'm probably going to do none of this. <laughs> you know? none? I'd rather, I'd rather like, um, you know, if Rick Lay says he wants to take us all out to dinner, I'd much rather do that, you know? Well, so Matt, this yeah. is actually why I built two events around food and drink. Right. We're well, hosting that Patreon dinner Saturday night. Right. And then at almost right after that, I'm going to do bar trivia. The last year for bar trivia, I couldn't even get in the room. I, I'd been off to like I'd been off to one of the things I was talking about, which was like a performance from like I don't know eight to ten, and you were going to start off at ten o'clock. And I said but we can still make it, and it was like such a mob scene. It's like well, hell with that. It, it was a standing. We had a very small room, and I think there probably were a hundred people in there. Yeah, I just I couldn't make it in. But you know that's that goes back to that's one of the choices that you make. Right. I just sat and I looked at all the things that I really want to do, and I'm probably going to – there's only one absolute thing that I've decided I must do, and that interferes with something else I really want to do. Well, I'll, I'll tell you a, a funny story. Is I don't know if it was last year or the, the, the time before, but, but I spent a good portion of the convention trying to track down um, the director of Reanimator. Um, Stuart Gordon, yeah. Stuart Gordon, yeah. And no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't catch up with him. I was always in the middle of something, and by the time I got to wherever he was supposed to be, it was over. So I finally just gave up, and then Monday morning, I'm having breakfast, and I look over, and he sits down right next to me. Ironically, in that same convention, I kept running into him everything I did, just – not on purpose, but just, you know, I'd, I'd, he'd be sitting nearby something I was doing, things like that. Yeah. So. I, I had an experience like that, too, because I was dying to see Ramsey Campbell. And if I didn't go, and, and Mike, I having lunch with him, but he didn't invite me, and I'm going crazy. I'm I sorry. Him. I didn't know. I didn't know. I would have. I'm never going to see Ramsey Campbell. So we go to the <laughs> breakfast, and he sits down right opposite me. And we had a wonderful time. His lovely wife. Well, I got to tell you how that whole lunch thing. I basically asked Ramsey if you want if you want to go to lunch during the convention. He's like, "Yeah, sure." And then Joe said, "I really want to get Ramsey for this uh, Caligari." Yeah, Caligari 
uh, anthology I'm doing. So can I please go to lunch with you? So I said, yeah. And that's how that happened. So I, I didn't, I, nobody was meant to be invited, but you know, I'm glad Joe went because well, it all, I was saying it all worked out. You're, you're going to be surprised who sits down for you when, for, for breakfast. Yeah. So it's, it, my advice to listeners who think uh, they're going to go to Necronomicon and they've never been before, it's like you better pick like that one thing you absolutely cannot miss and then just sort of go with the flow. And if you know your choice is like um, a couple of people that you really like are going out and grabbing lunch, that maybe that is worth more than going to another panel. Right. Well, you yeah. may have a problem that you're assigned to a panel. I'm going to be late for the Pantheon dinner because King and Yellow panel begins at six. Well, we'll save a spot for you. Yeah. 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 Pete and I will remember to save a spot for you at the Patreon dinner. Yeah. So, you know, the thing you can do uh, is go to necronomicon providence.com and then under program, look at extended programming and core programming. And I don't know. I'd suggest just sitting down and making a list of what you really, really want to do. And like Matt said, that one or two things that you really don't want to miss no matter what. Right. To me, you know, it's, it's, I'm going to echo Matt's comment here, but it's a lot like going to the Magic Kingdom. You have to see certain things, and other things are going to happen, and you're going to go, oh, I want to take advantage of that right now. And you're going to take advantage of it, and that means that something else is going to get pushed off the list. Okay. You should be okay with that. Except there won't be like tons of babes in arms and strollers and mechanized scooters and thousands of people you don't like between you and the next ride. <laughs> wait, wait, wait a well, 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 you can fit in the whole Magic Kingdom if you're there multiple days. Yeah. But uh, even though we have multiple days for that, I mean, none of these sessions is being repeated. That that is true. So, right. what are you? What are you guys looking forward to, Matt? What what are, what are those things that you really feel like okay. you didn't want to miss? There were two or three things. I mean, there's a lot of things, but well, okay. I try to do something different each time I go, and I've never done Lovecraftian gaming. And since my oldest son is going, and he's big into role playing games, we're going to be doing like a, a Delta Green, and we're going to be doing an Arkham Horror. Okay, so that's my mornings. Uh, but, okay, you know, I've got an interest in Lovecraft's death, which I think has been not well represented by the diagnosis on his birth certificate. Well, there's a physician from the University of Virginia who's doing a presentation. I just discovered this as the Armitage Symposium. Uh, it's like Friday afternoon at like 4 o'clock. So I talked to Rebecca Alred. I'm a radiation oncologist. She's a pathologist. We're both going to go, and it's going to be like a mini tumor board. I'm very interested in what he has to say. <laughs> the problem is, it conflicted with the other thing I really wanted to do, which was drive in Lovecraft, where there's this old collector who's got all this 70s and 80s memorabilia. He's going to do a presentation on it. Trump, yeah. It's just the way it goes. But so uh, the, the, for the, the absolute must thing that I now want to go to is this uh, clinical pathological conference. Yeah. I really like how they're describing the uh, Lovecraftian trivia night on the website. McCormick and Schmicks, our pal, Pete Rollick, is a trivia master. Well, that's Started because... With our pal. <laughs> is that because uh, they haven't met you? Ne well, Niels came down to uh, Palm Beach and for a conference, and he happened to be free the night that I was playing my trivia game, and it was... It was um, the finals and we were in the championship mode and so Niels came to our bar and had trivia with us. No big deal. But you know Well you're a pal now. I'm a pal, yes. But I also like McCormick and Schmicks, so Yeah, that's a good place. Uh anybody else want to talk about what they're looking forward to? Kelly? God, you're a dick. What, did, did you go to school to be a dick? <laughs> Do you need a license to be that much of a dick? Or does it just come naturally? <laughs> uh, it was the elephant in the room. I had to say it. Kelly can't go, unfortunately. Wait a second. That makes it sound like I've been banned or something. I'm boycotting <laughs> it this year. So, 
But to be clear, Kelly Young is allowed to go to Necronomicon. That's right. Oh, that's why I brought it up. I thought you weren't allowed to go to Necronomicon. No, no, I'm boycotting. <laughs> but if you had enough, wait. If you boycott it, will you like really boycott it? No, I'm boycotting it, but I will be wishing I was there. The well, time. if you're going to the film festival, I may boycott the film festival. <laughs> We're gonna have such a good time at the film festival. Yeah, it's gonna be a blast. I'm bummed that everybody else is not coming to the film festival. Oh, bite me. I know, see? I had to make a decision. What decision? Well, like you Sophie, know... It's like Sophie's Choice. <laughs> yeah. But no, it, it, it was... It, I actually had a plan. You know, it was like since Necronomicon is held every other year, I would go to, to the, the film festival on the other year. That way, you know, I'm not traveling all over the country. And uh, unfortunately, last year, I got rained out by a hurricane. So, didn't get to go last year, and I'm not going to get to go this year. Yeah. Well, the film festival should be smart enough that the book was Necronomicon. Well, it's not the same time. Yeah, it's not the same time. It's uh, yeah. October. Yeah. And the film festival is 20 years into doing this at the same time. I think that they're kind of set in the time yeah. to rent this. Uh, you know, so is the problem out. just cost? Yeah, well, it's, it's – look, I, I've still got kids. I still have projects. I still uh, – I, 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 I'm not criticizing it. It's yeah. It's that you can't it, afford it. It's not cost. It's, it's the time. It, it's time. It's, that's the thing is it's time. I – if I go do this by myself, which I usually do, I think that's self-indulgent to the rest of my family. Do you see what I mean? I allow myself to do that like one thing a year maybe. So if I go to the Necronomicon, I feel terribly guilty if I then say we're going to the film festival and that means me. Yeah. No, no I, I understand. It's just like I would love to go to Howard Days, the Robert E. Howard one, but I have right. too many things. You should let that guilt go and just um, <laughs> be, think of it as therapy. Let it go. It, it's wait, wait, wait. Uh, how's your marriage going? It's making you old, mate. Just let it go. <laughs> worry How, how's your marriage working out there, Kelly? Ah. Uh, <laughs> ouch. Uh, yeah, I do miss my wife and son terribly every time I. Yeah, at the beginning. I miss them the whole time, but especially at the beginning when I'm thinking, do I really want to go? Because, you know, anytime I go to a con, do I really want to go? Because I'm going to miss them too much. But then you get there and you are you got friends to talk to and lots of things to do and it's better. All right. You hit the strip clubs and pretty soon you're not thinking about your wife and kids at all. <laughs> That's your version of a convention. Yeah. How's Brandy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Watching this right now, sending him a text going, you ass. <laughs> All right. Uh, anything else we have to talk about? I've got this. Sherlock Holmes versus Cthulhu just arrived in the mail from straight from Lois Gresh. Um, you can cold. sign it for me. That's nice. Uh, She's going to be there, isn't she? Yes. Yeah. I believe so, yes. The, the funny thing is that there's two Sherlock Holmes versus Cthulhu series going on right now. What do you mean? Well, no. Uh, hmm? Lois Gresh is doing that, but um, James Lovegrove is writing a, a, a Lovecraft versus Cthulhu series, too. Oh, really? I think it's James Lovegrove. Wait a second. Is right? You just said a Lovecraft versus Cthulhu series. Well, uh, Cthulhu versus Sherlock Holmes. Sorry. Oh, okay, okay. Um, let me double check that. Well, while you double check that, I'll read the back of this, and it's available now. A uh, series of grisly murders rocks London. At each location, only a jumble of bones remains of the deceased, along with a bizarre sphere covered in a strange, covered in strange symbols. Excuse me. The son of the latest victim seeks the help of Sherlock Holmes and his former partner, Dr. John Watson. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Ancient schematics. Otherworldly critters 
critters, creatures to enter our dimension seeking to wreak havoc and destruction. But of course, Holmes has got to stop them. I, I started this and I really am enjoying it so far. So Yeah, he's got uh, the Cthulhu case books. The first one is Sherlock Holmes and the Shadwell Shadows. And the next one is Sherlock Holmes and the Miskatonic Monstrosities. Lois wrote those two? No, James Lovegrove. Oh, Lovegrove, okay. Yeah, and I know I know Lois is working on a, a follow-up to this book. So it's sort of like competing Holmes Cthulhu. Uh, then we have Shadows Over Baker Street from right. about, what, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, something like that. Something like that. And then there was even an earlier one, Ralph Vaughn wrote some Sherlock Holmes versus the Cthulhu stuff. Really? Yep. I think pretty much everyone on this board disagrees with me about Shadows Over Baker Street, don't you? Yeah, I liked a couple of the stories in that. Yeah. Yeah, I liked a couple. I liked about 75% of the stories in there. That's I why I was telling you that you need to pick up Mark Frost's uh, The List of Seven and then the sequel, The Six Messiahs. I know that you would love those, Mike. Yeah. What, what, what are they about? What, is it the Sherlock Holmes Cthulhu thing? They're kind of about Sherlock Holmes. They're about um, Watson and the person he hooks up with, who you can tell is the basis for Sherlock Holmes. Watson? Sherlock Holmes is an him? Yes. Well, not as Sherlock Holmes, no. But the person that Watson writes about is the person that he is having these adventures with. Wait, He's a real wait, person wait, in wait, Watson. Sorry, right. Kelly, when you said hooks up, I got a very different connotation. <laughs> he um, sure he Netflixes go. and chills with the guy who will become Sherlock Holmes. Okay, that's better. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll say those titles again. The List of Seven, and then the sequel is The Six Messiahs. The Six Messiahs is not as good, but The List of Seven is brilliant. I passed that on to my mom, and she told me it was the best book she had ever read. She loved it that much. Really? And, and I, I loved it a lot, too. Yeah, I'm loving it. And that's the, the, the co-creator of Twin Peaks wrote that. Oh, yeah, that Mark Frost. Yeah. I'm loving your uh, name tag today, by the way. Uh, what did I what did I put down here? Uh, who put that statement. on here? God damn it, Mike! <laughs> I I don't have the power to do that. <laughs> I have the power to kick you off. I have the power to mute you, but I don't have the power to do that. Uh, yeah. Is, is it Watson or Doyle? Oh, you know what? I, I'm gonna have to pop it open. Maybe it is. Maybe it is Doyle. Maybe it's Arthur Conan Doyle who is the protagonist and the person that he's working with becomes. Yeah, uh, Sherlock that Holmes makes more comes. sense. I, I, I haven't read it. I, 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 I thought the blurs made it to oil. Okay, you understand yeah. that uh, for an internist, and I trained in internal medicine, that the actual precursor who gave Doyle the glint of an idea of Holmes was Bell. Right. Of Bell Palsy. Right. And I read some actual things where, like, patients would come into his office and he'd tell them where they had come from and uh, how many children they had had and then give them their diagnosis without ever doing more than just a cursory glance. And then he'd explain to his intern, Doyle, how he came to those conclusions. There's a guy on America's Got Talent right now. Well, I haven't watched it in a couple of weeks. Danielle loves to watch it, so I would watch it with her. That there's a guy on America's Got Talent who can do all of that. You know, he builds himself as the real life Sherlock Holmes. And it's, I got to say, it's pretty amazing. There was also a television series, I think it was called Murder Rooms, which had Joseph Bell and Doyle solving mysteries. Not familiar with it. That sounds like a BBC series or something, it was maybe. Not in a mystery, uh, you know, a masterpiece theater. Okay. Had the uh, Ian Richardson. Played uh, Holmes. We I mean, played uh, Bell. He had, he had played Holmes actually in some earlier cable movies. There's, if, if you're interested in Sherlock Holmes, there's a Dan Simmons movie or book. I'm sorry, where I can't I can't remember the title of it right now. Mr. But, Drood. No. 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 Not, not Mr. Drood. Mm -mm. Nope. It's 
Sherlock Holmes begins to suspect that he's not real, that he's a literary character. And it's pretty interesting. There's some fourth wall breakage in the in the book, a little bit of that. It's it's a really interesting book. I wish I could remember the title right now. I don't know. Google Dan Simmons and Sherlock Holmes. I'm sure you'll come across it. Shoot, I'm looking through my collection right now. I can't remember which one that is. Did Mr. Drew that? was about Dickens, wasn't it? Yeah. Did you read the one I'm talking about? Um, I think I read, this is about 10 years old now, right? No, it's about two or three years old. You're talking about no. the fifth heart? The fifth heart. Thank you. Okay. Yep, that's it. The Fifth Heart by Dan Simmons. Very good book. I really enjoyed it. Now, there is a Sherlock Holmes series by the author of the Carnacki, of the new Carnacki Adventures, William Merkel. Michael. Michael. Is it Michael or Meikle? Uh, yeah, I don't know. M-E-I-K-L-E. Yeah, yeah. And one of them is called The Dreaming Man. The other is called Sherlock Holmes Revenant. So to me, they sound like they have supernatural angles. And the dreaming man makes me think of Lovecraft because of the whole dreaming angle. And uh, the, Michael, or however we pronounce it, has a tendency to inject into these stories mythos elements that are sometimes not in the forefront, a little more subdued in the background. You know, Willie Meikle is a really good example of a great writer who has been doing, who, who's kind of under the radar in a lot of ways, but who's been doing what he, what he enjoys for a very, very long time. You know, uh, he makes a living as a writer. He's been doing it for a long time. I just, I really respect that guy, you know. I'm also publishing a Karnacki book uh, this fall of his. So, very cool. Uh, a new Karnacki? Yeah, a new Karnacki. Because yeah. he's had about at least two. Yep. He's in so, technologies all over the place with Karnacki. All right, we got anything else to talk about? You guys are quiet today. No, I'm just, I'm really looking forward to seeing you all in a couple days in Providence. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Now, I, I do not know at this moment if we're doing a live show because if, 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 we, if we did a live show at Necronomicon at the regular time, at this time, it would be when most of the guests have gone home, including, right. including. And, and the audience has gone home at 6 o'clock on, on Sunday night is when the convention's wrapping up. I say you record the Patreon dinner and then release it as an episode. <laughs> if I could get everybody that's at the table that's on, then we, it could be a Patreon episode. They could listen to it later. You're a very bad man, Kelly. I know. I'm a dick. <laughs> you just, you just, you just want to be part of the Patreon dinner and you can't be there. So I, I am, I am bummed that I'm not going to be able to meet everybody. Yeah. We, we just want to have dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I've, I've basically said, hey, why don't you take this uh, relaxing time in your busy day and turn it into a business thing? <laughs> yeah, that's true. You did say that. And you call me a dick. All right. Well, um, short episode, but uh, we fit three guests in. Um, we will see, I hope most of you at Necronomicon and then after that we'll be back on our regular schedule so we'll see you then thanks for listening appreciate it